series where I use IMDb to discover and talk about all different types of movies and TV shows and how the people in front of and behind the camera not only make it all possible, but are somehow all interconnected. I talk directly with the talent about their backstories and experiences on and off set and what they're up to today. On my last episode, I talked with actor Jack McBrayer, who was in 30 Rock and Wreck-It Ralph. Tina Fey was also in 30 Rock and in one of my all-time favorite movies, Mean Girls. So today, we're going to be talking about Mean Girls. And I am honored to welcome my guest today, director of Mean Girls, Mark Waters. Mean Girls is about this girl named Katie who moves from Africa and to this new high school. And she becomes friends with this boy and the girl who aren't very popular. And then these popular girls, also known as the plastics in the movie, want to be friends with Katie. So here, Katie has this choice of who she's going to pick. But the boy and the girl decide that let that because they they're so mean the plastics they want to see what it what what they talk about and how mean they are out of school too so they have katie pretend to be in their friend group and then chaos just breaks out from there but it's such a funny movie and if you're in middle school or high school it's a really good movie to watch because it really teaches you life lessons and just what life is like in high school and middle school and how to get through it and it's just a really funny movie and i love it so much in addition to Mean Girls, Mark Waters has also directed Freaky Friday, Vampire Academy, Mr. Popper's Penguins, Magic Camp, He's All That, and many more. And now, without further ado, here's my interview with Mark Waters. How did you get started in the film business? Oh my, the big doozy of a question. Yes. Um, you know, the story of me getting started is kind of linked to my brother. My brother is a screenwriter, and he wrote Heathers, wrote Batman Returns, Demolition Man, amongst other things. And he, uh, he's somebody who knew what he wanted to do from the time he was 12. I mean, he wrote screenplays when he was 12, you know, in, in seventh grade, and about him as a secret agent in our, in our middle school. And, and so he, uh, he, he, he was, you know, and he, I think he saw Jaws, one summer and said, I'm going to be a screenwriter. And that was then that was that he was just committed to it at that point. And um, I, on the other hand, had no interest in, in any, any of the arts. I was a basketball player, tennis player. I was kind of smart. I was valedictorian in my high school, you know, but I, and I went to an Ivy league school to study medicine. I was going to be a neurosurgeon <laughs> and then and, uh, got sidetracked there. Yay, Cause I didn't really like, um, didn't like other people who wanted to be doctors, so I didn't enjoy the social life around that. And also, I kind of moved from South Bend, Indiana, to Philadelphia, and went to New York all the time. And suddenly, was going to see theater and seeing independent films and seeing all these things. Suddenly, I was like, "Oh, wait a second, maybe you know, I do have an interest in the arts." And I kind of, you know, ended up graduating from Penn with like an economics degree, but also a minor in theater arts. My parents were like, what's this minor in theater arts about? We didn't know you'd take any theater classes. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was just for fun. You know, but meanwhile, I was secretly plotting to not be a doctor, not be a lawyer. And, and just said, and I kind of ended up, uh, I ended up like studying acting, traveling through Europe, living in Berlin for a while, thinking I was going to work in theater there. And, and then I came back and moved to San Francisco where I continued studying acting, but I also started directing just little, like, you know, kind of 50 seat house theater shows and, and, and kind of uh, felt, you know, and, and usually things, sometimes I was acting in it myself, sometimes it was just people from my acting classes. And um, eventually I started to kind of get hired to direct. Like people saw some of my little puppet shows and were like, oh, you know, hey, we we actually have a little bit of money. Can you direct this thing? And, and you basically go around and start calling yourself a director. And people, there's so many actors who want to do shows. They're like, yeah, sure, we'll we, we'll pay you to be a director. So so I started doing that. And then and meanwhile, at the same time, concurrently, my brother was having like really a lot of success. He moved straight from college, went to L.A., sold Heathers. Heathers was a big cult hit. You should watch it sometime um, with Christian Slater and Winona Ryder. And, and then, and I remember I, in the, you know, I visited the set of some of his movies and thought to myself, 
gosh, these directors are terrible. You know, because they, they give me good. Let me put it this way: they were terrible with actors. They, they, they. When they go up and talk, I would watch them talking to the actors, and they'd be like, "Okay, um, let's do it again." And uh, yeah, let's just do it again. And, and meanwhile, the actors were like, "What?" You know, like, like you know, they have this look on their face of like, he's not happy, but he's not telling me what's, what's going on. You know, and then like, come to another take, like, uh, funnier, funnier, okay, funnier. And I'm like, you can't say that to an actor. So because I I come from that theater background, I knew well if I could learn all these cranes and cameras and lenses and things, I could probably do this. And and meanwhile, living my kind of poet vagabond lifestyle in San Francisco was growing a little bit tiresome. So I got, I applied and got into uh, film school at the American Film Institute in in LA. And so then I went to AFI. I went there for two years, made some short films. I wrote some screenplays. You know, it was kind of a struggle at first because I didn't, didn't, things didn't take off as fast as I wanted them to. But within two years after graduating, I was on set directing my first movie called The House of Yes. Which, uh, yeah. Have you heard of that movie? I've heard of it. I haven't watched it though, but I've heard of it. How old are you now? I'm 12. I turned 13 in July. I wouldn't recommend The House of Yes yet. Mm-hmm. You know, the, I wouldn't recommend that, but uh, just because it's, uh, it's a little, a little dark. <laughs> anyway, my, mom, my mom was actually telling me, um, a little, like a little bit, like, like this morning, and she said I watched it like a while, like a while ago, and she said it's like very, like, cr- like crazy and like dark sort of. Um, yeah, but- I mean, I think you could probably handle it in a couple of years. You know, I don't know. My my fifteen year old watches like the craziest stuff, and I'm not, and I'm just, I don't know what to just stop her <laughs> so she can, but I was just say that, that I made that movie, and I spent a year, you know, uh, editing it, and then I, I got into um, Sundance Film Festival with it, and the, at the Sundance Film Festival, I met my wife, I met my, my, my future agent and my future producing partner that the opening weekend of the, uh, of the, the, the festival. And, um, you know, the movie sold at, at, to, at back, back then to Miramax, which was like the biggest company back then. They, they were the biggest company in independent film. And, you know, I got signed by CAA, which was the biggest agency. And, and thing, you know, even though my next movie was a complete disaster and put me in movie jail, kind of, um, I did kind of have a career at that point. And then I, my next movie after that was Freaky Friday, which was a big hit. So, so then, uh, you know, I kind of was able to sustain a little bit longer career, but, but the, 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 you know, getting there, you know, it was a bit of a struggle, but not as big of a struggle as some people have for sure. Yes, definitely. And that's amazing. All this stuff that, like that, that you did, it just kept building up and building up to like great. Mm-hmm. Um, and did you have a favorite movie as a kid that inspired you? As a kid? That's interesting. Yes, I would say that, that it's a good question. And um, because there's kind of your movies that, that are your favorite movies as a kid and your movies that become your favorite movies once you become kind of a snobby film person. And, <laughs> and they're, they're different movies. But I would say growing up, I loved Robert Zemeckis' movies. And, 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 I lo- and I love Spielberg's movies, too. Like, like Raiders of the Lost Ark was one of my favorites. You know, I, I loved it. I loved Jaws, too. But I really loved Back to the Future and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And those are movies that just very much stuck with me as, wow, if I could, if I could make a movie, I'd want to make a movie that good. That yeah. has, that's, that's kind of about something, but also is just wildly entertaining, you know, and, and inventive. And, uh, you know, that was kind of, I mean, frankly, making movies like Freaky Friday and Spider Chronicles, Mr. Proverbs Penguins, I'm always trying to do something that's a little bit fantastical, but also has a grounded reality to it. But, yeah. uh, but I mean, th- those are the movies I kind of just kind of nakedly loved. And then when I got older, I, I, I would say my favorite movies were things like The Godfather, The Conformist by Bertolucci, uh, Dr. Strangelove by Kubrick those are kind of in the pantheon of things, Wings of Desire by Wim Vendors. But these are all pretentious film snob answers. But the, the, the fact is, like, I like Zemeckis and Spielberg when I started when I was young. So. Yeah, I've watched Back to the Future like hundreds of times. I love that Oh, movie. really? 
Yeah. And going on Mean Girls now, how did Mean Girls come your way? Well, the I was just finishing Freaky Friday, mm-hmm. and Freaky Friday had what we call a lot of buzz back then. People were excited about the movie. Disney was excited about releasing it. The test previews for it had been ex- exceptional and, and had tested very high. And word was kind of around town like, oh, this movie Freaky Friday is going to be big. And Lindsay Lohan, who's in Freaky Friday, is also going to blow up off of this movie. And and so my my agent sent me this script, which was called Homeschooled. And it was a just a brilliant script by Tina Fey that was, it was also completely R rated. There was, everybody was cussing all over the place. There were so many F bombs all over the script and, and I loved it. And I, and I, because I, uh, before my agent had sent it to me, I said, I want to read everything, but don't send me any high school movies. Cause I, if I have to hear locker door slamming, when I call, background action i'm going to shoot myself because i just did it i just finished high school movie freaky friday's high school movie and then said but this is so good i'm like dang it okay i guess i'll beat on this and so i met lena i mean uh tina and lauren we got on really well and they seemed to understand that i kind of got it they i would think about when it comes to directing comedy i'm not a terribly funny guy I'm, but I, I have a great sense of humor. I know what is funny and what isn't. And so when I'm directing actors, when I'm ch- choosing lines, when I'm editing a movie, I'm very con- I'm conscious of how to make something funny. I'm just not the person who's going to write it, like Tina, who's a genius, you know. But and then uh, and then the head of Paramount at the time, Sherry Lansing and John Goldwyn, they saw free. We ran Freaky Friday for them in their screening room, and they loved it and said we have to get him you know, to direct this movie. And Tina and Lauren were very happy about it because they also liked me quite a bit. And uh, and then we had a great collaboration. It was just really, you know, one of the the more fun, uh, even though we had to make it for very little money and very little time, it was really fun creatively to work on that because it was just great material. And when Tina was available, I had the, the best punch up writer in the business sitting there in Video Village. So I could always just go over to her and say, this line's not working, which we try. And she'd come with like, five lines in a minute that were as good or better. So. Yeah. And in Mean Girls, the situations like um, the girls are in are funny, but also so real, like the bullying and pressure to fit in and dress a certain way, act a certain way. Did the tone of the movie change at all as you were developing it? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the, the tone of the movie that I had in my head was always the same which is in one of my rules of, of how to make comedy work is to never go for a joke. If you're, if you're trying to tell a joke, you're going to fail, you know, yeah. as a, as a filmmaker, yeah, I, performers, some performers are naturally funny and that's great, but I never ever pushed anybody to be funny. I just push people to be committed. If anything, I push them to be a little extra committed. That's kind of the difference, the heightened commitment, the heightened going for your action is what sometimes can make something funny and leading to obstacles and more sparks happen that way, as opposed to kind of doing it the kind of a low key way uh, for drama, for, for comedy, you want to play things with really high stakes. And, uh, and so that, yeah, it was, it was something that I think was different than any movies that have been made as quote unquote Saturday Night Live movies, you know, and, and I know that Lauren had made movies like Ladies Man and It's Pat and, and some of them really funny, but Paramount didn't want to have a, another SNL movie. So part of the thing that I brought to the table was saying, occasionally we're just not going to be funny. Occasionally it's just going to be real and dramatic. And and, been, and, I, and I could feel sometimes Lauren getting panicked. Like, why are we getting laughs now? And I was like, it's okay. We're getting bigger laughs later because, they actually, because the audience really cares so much about the characters. And when they, we put them in funny situations, we're going to get even bigger laughs. Yeah. And uh, and and that that was that was the the idea of the tone is that we kept it really authentic. Then the the humor is going to land, but also the drama was going to land. And hence, you know, the movies stood the test of time. People like to watch it not because it's an assemblage of jokes, but because it rings true. Yeah, definitely. And um, was there a lot of improv on set, or did everyone mostly stick to the script? Stuck to the script. Um, no improv. 
Mm-hmm. It was a, it, when you have a script that good, you you just try to nail it to the wall. You don't try to mess with it. Yeah. And um, like you were speaking of SNL before, um, is there like any behind the scenes stories um, behind set, especially with like the SNL cast, like Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, Tim Meadows? You know, I I remember one of the funnier things was having our, you know, the the gentleman who played uh, Kevin Napoor. Rajiv Surendra. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, who's who's a great kid and uh the you know, he, he was such a sweetheart and not really that like that character at all. Just like the nicest kind of good student, good really polite kid. So getting him to be kind of like a baller wannabe rapper type was not his natural instinct. But it was really hilarious because Tina and Amy, who were you know, approaching middle-aged women at this point, were the ones who kind of gave him boot camp on how to how to how to dance and how to rap. And mm-hmm. seeing them coach him, it was you know we didn't videotape it, but we should have. But it was very comical to see see them to see them get down and dirty and, and teach Rajiv to uh, to find his inner rapper. <laughs> That's so funny. And um, you worked with Lindsay Lohan on Freaky Friday, too. Um, did you think of her for the role of Katie and Mean Girls right away? No, no. Actually, actually, I thought of her for Regina. And, yeah. and I, thought, I thought she would be a perfect Regina. Actually, I, when I gave her the script, I said, you should read this for Regina. And she says, I love it. I'm dying to play Regina. This is amazing. And then, and, and we actually started looking for another Katie and couldn't find one. And we were looking at, I remember this, this uh, young actress came in who just blew me away. And I, and I remember saying to her in the room, when Marcy will test of this, I said, you are a movie star. You are incredible. You're just wrong for this. You're too old. I'm sorry to say that, but you are too old for this, to play this innocent, this Katie girl. And, um, and she said, I understand. Thank you for the compliment. And then Freaky Friday came out and uh, Sherry Lansing said, had basically had a come to Jesus moment with me where she said, I said, look, Lindsay Lohan has to play Katie. Well, she's too big of a star now. We can't have her play Regina. We need her to play Katie and we'll find somebody else to play Regina. And I said, okay, there it is. Uh, I understand completely. We'll find another uh, Regina. So then I called back the actress who I said was too old, Rachel oh. McAdams, and, and Rachel McAdams, who was 24 at the time, not, not that old at all. And she then kind of blew it out of the water reading and, and playing, playing Regina. And, oh. uh, and so that, that was a, uh, you know, that, 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 that was an unexpected gift from the process was that we remembered her and said, wait, suddenly she might be perfect for this other part. Mm-hmm. Similarly, the, the Amanda Zyfred, who plays Karen, she came in and read for Regina as well. And she oh. was great. She was great. We tested her as Regina. Yeah, opposite Lindsay. And she was really interesting, but she just didn't intimidate Lindsay as much as Rachel did. Rachel, mm-hmm. just, because she was older, she was a more established actress. Lindsay was a little bit nervous around her. And I thought not many people make Lindsay nervous. So this is a good thing to know. I think she could be the perfect person. And then, uh, and then when we were trying to cast Karen, uh, Lauren remembered Amanda and said, I think she should come in and read for the dumb girl, you know, mm-hmm. and we're like, okay. And, and she, she ended up uh, nailing it. And, uh, has had quite an an incredible career since then. Yeah, definitely. I that's what I wasn't, and I was like waiting for you to say that the girl before was going to be like someone that was in the cast. Like, yeah, you said um, Rachel McAdams was like came in. I was waiting for you to say that she was going to yes. come back. Yes. <laughs> um, and Mean Girls is still so popular today. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I mean, it's a, there's a, there's always going to be this time in people's lives when there's the pressures of high school. It was one of the reasons why we purposely didn't try to make it isolated at a point in time, even with costumes and everything. We, we really, really tried to make it seem like, okay, this is something that could feel like kids were going to high school back, you know, in the, ni- in the 1990s or, you know, or in the, in the 1980s or as, as it was at the, the turn of the century when we made it. We wanted to feel like, oh yeah, this this could be any high school at any time, and and, and there's always and people will always kind of find it at a certain age. You, you, I find younger and younger. Usually, I tell parents like, don't show it to 
to, to girls to their 13th birthday, but I find a lot of 12 year old girls are watching it too. And so that's something where, you know, they, they find it and realize, oh wait, this speaks to me and kind of what I'm going through right now and the tension of it. And, and usually makes people feel better realizing, oh, the, the tension of high school is going to pass. It's a finite amount of time and you're going to kind of move through it and become something else. But but while you're in it, it, it speaks to people. So. Yeah, definitely. And I also love the way the movies, um, the movie uses voiceover when Katie expresses her inner thoughts. Was that in the script from the beginning? Yes, it was always in the script from the beginning. It's one, one of the reasons that was one of the, the filmic techniques we, we exploited in the movie was I shot a lot of uh, of the movie shooting it at 48 frames a second, which is. Um, Basically, film is shot at 24 frames a second. If you shoot at something higher than that, like 48 or 72, um, it, it, that's slow motion. And it kind of goes into slow motion the more, the higher you spend it. If you go to 120, it's really slow motion, you know? And so I always do divisible frame rates that are divisible with 24. So you can always go, you could have somebody sitting and listening in slow motion and then they can start to talk and you ramp it down to 24 frames a second. And they and so we did a lot of her stuff, a lot of Lindsay's photography shooting at 40 frames because we knew we had to fit in big chunks of voiceover yeah. while she's just in the middle of a conversation. And then, but then we wanted to continue the conversation without cutting away from her. So that's something we did because we, but, but we planned that while we were shooting so that we knew that we'd have that, that latitude later to, uh, to cut around it. Yeah, that's smart. And um, one of the final scenes is at the school dance. And I noticed that a lot of teen movies have a location, a prom or a dance. Why do you think that is? <laughs> Why does it work so well? Did you did you see, by the way, the, the movie I made for Netflix last year called He's All, uh, that. He's All that. Yeah. yeah, that also had a big prom finale, you know, and uh, it, it is it's it, I find that a lot of movies in general build up to some big event. Yeah. You know, where they, and, and, and it just happens in a high school movie, you don't really have a much bigger event than prom. You yeah. know, there's there's the, the, and so, you know, and, and I'm trying to think about uh, other things I've done, you know, like uh, I'm trying to think of Mr. Mr. Popper's Penguin also kind of like, I think, built up to it. What was the climax? Wasn't the, the Guggenheim? It was uh it was, it was basically the big event where they were they were kind of reopening the restaurants. So, but you always having some big event is usually a good thing to kind of to have in your third act. And yeah. and and high schools, the high school prom seems like a, a pretty obvious one. Um, and you've directed so many other amazing movies like Freaky Friday, Vampire Academy, Spider with Chronicles, Magic Camp. He's all that. Mr. Popper's Penguins. And is there any one movie you felt connected to the most? It, you didn't mention it, by the way. My fa- my favorite movie of the ones I've made. You still need to see it, but uh, it, it, it's called Just Like Heaven with Reese Witherspoon and Mark Ruffalo, and uh, and and also uh, um, the 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 fourth lead in the movie is my wife, and so it was one of the only time I actually got to work with my wife on a movie, which was really fun. She played Reese Witherspoon's big sister in, in the movie, but it's a. Uh, it's, it's it's actually a movie that is there's nothing risque about it. It's a little bit adult in themes because it deals with life and death, but it's uh but I think it's it's a beautiful movie and it was one of the movies that I think most was kind of most had the biggest depth of emotion of anything I worked on and uh, I and so I I I, I love that experience. It was a great experience making it. And I love how it came out and uh, and my most recent movie is is something I'm really excited about. It's also a little bit off the beaten path of what I've made before. It's called Harvest Moon, and it's about a family quarantining during the beginning of the pandemic, while the and the, the parents have just split up, and the boy, the new boyfriend of the mother and the the father are forced to quarantine at the same place together, and zany hijinks ensue. But uh, it is a uh, but, but uh, that I just what I'm just finishing right now, and uh, going to be have it done by Memorial Day. That's cool. I have to watch that then. Yeah, yeah. We have to watch Just Like Heaven first. But, uh, and then watch it with your mom. I think you'll like it. Yeah. Was it is it on Netflix? I feel like I've seen it on Netflix. It, I think it was on Netflix for a while. I'm not sure if it's currently in rotation, 
but it's you know it's on it's on some stream right now probably <laughs> i'll have to watch it and i know that the spider with chronicles had a lot of effects which were incredible like um one actor playing two roles um was that movie was that the most challenging movie you, you directed or was there any others that were very challenging as well i mean i have to say every movie has its own challenges and and different ones um but you know, and the, 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 sometimes the most challenging movies I've made are movies like He's All That. It's an extraordinarily difficult movie, mainly because we had to shoot it in 23 days. You know, so we had 23 days to make a movie with all of these, um, you know, huge set pieces and the prom and the, the, the Gatsby party, all these things. And meanwhile, in Spider Man Chronicles, we shot for 70 days and it was, it was really difficult. But, it, but what wasn't difficult was I didn't have a, the pressure of money. They they basically said, yeah, you have all, you have a lot of money to work with, but you just have to deal with this crazy bad weather. A British boy who's working on American action, playing against himself as identical twins, you know, like creatures who were going to be, make, come, you know, we just basically had a ball on set and you had to imagine there was a creature, you know, yeah. and and the and the thousand visual effect shots. You know that Mr. Popper's penguins also had had yeah. live penguins that we kept in a in a pen. Uh, we <laughs> built an actual penguin habitat off the stage, yeah. and so we worked with live penguins and as CGI penguins as well to do complicated things. So it was it was that was uh, and, and Jim Carrey, who's an incredible perfectionist and an incredible talent, but you know we also had to kind of like make make a great movie with uh, with, with kind of pleasing all of these different, uh, these kind of uh, challenges throughout. So, but, but Spider-Man certainly was a tough one. I mean, but it was a weird thing about the movies that just took so long to make. We, you know, they, that by the time it was done, we were all a little surprised that it came out so good. We were like, I'm not being immodest about that, but we're like, oh, the movie actually works, you know? Because while we were in the middle of the, the forest in Montreal getting rained on, we were just like, why are we doing here? This is a disaster. And uh, it ended up not being one, so that was good. Yeah, I, I love the movie. It was so, it was really good. And I know you just, you've been, um, where you, were work, you are almost finished with Harvest Moon, but do you have any other upcoming projects you can talk a little bit about? There's nothing that I'm, uh, I'm signed on to make. I have other things that... That I have been, I've had in development for a while. I have this uh, adaptation of a Korean movie, an adaptation of a French film, where we've written the script and I really like the script, and but uh, you know, still trying to get it cast and get financing and stuff. But uh, I find that I like working in the independent world a bit more now, just because I I reached a point where I like having more creative control and not necessarily getting paid as much, but getting more fun making the movie that I want to make without having to answer to anybody. Uh-huh. Yeah, definitely. And before we end, um, I have this game I like to play. It's five rapid fire questions. And I'll ask you five oh, questions boy. Um, very fast. And just whatever, like, first pops into your mind. But it's also okay if you, like, need a minute to think about it um, and you answer it. So, um, so first <laughs> So the first question, um, if you could play a role in any of your movies, what role would that be? <laughs> yeah, <do this. laughs> um great question so me I, it's hard for me to i'm going to go through things in my head okay. i would say it it was the role of marty in the house of yes my first movie the oh. role played by josh hamilton mm -hmm. um and favorite on set or editing room snack snacks mm -hmm. oh and that's a good question as well on set, I, I I treat myself to six Swedish fish after lunch every day. You know, in the wow. editing room, in the editing room, I'm usually trying to lose weight because I ate too much during production. And so, in the editing room, I literally will have a half cup of of really sugary cereal, like Oreo cereal, with wow. my coffee, and that will be my snack in the editing room. And and I'll limit myself to little fifty calorie snacks throughout the day because I'm basically trying to lose my production weight. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what is your favorite vacation spot? I love going to Hawaii for, mm. when, for relaxation and swimming. 
And I love going to New York for getting an, an adrenaline shot in my neck and going and uh, seeing shows and, and getting a lot of uh, fun energy. So those, these are those two extremes. So. Yeah, good answer. And um, what is one memory from high school that you can like share with me? Mm, my a memory from my, I mean, there's, there's obviously there's plenty of memories from my high school. Let me see if I can solidify one. Oh Lordy. Um, <laughs> I'm, I gotta avoid going risque with this too, of course. Uh, the, the um, let me see. Okay, I'll tell you a memory. This, 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 this is the first thing that came to my head that I, I played football, and, mm-hmm. and, but I wasn't a good football player. I was a really good basketball player, good tennis player. But I remember in ninth grade in football, because I was, I was really skinny, but I, for some reason, they had me playing defensive end. and. I and uh, we were, the other team was punting. My no, the nose tackle blocked the punt. I I looked up in the air and I caught the ball, and then suddenly everybody was like tackling me. And I was and I looked up and all the people that were tackling me were people on my own team. And I said, "Why are you tackling me?" And like, "You just scored a touchdown. You're in the end zone." And, and I was standing in the end zone and I went like, "I scored a touchdown." And then it was like it was, it was a great sports moment, but uh, one that you know I didn't repeat ever again. But uh, <laughs> it just came to me now. So. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and if you could give your high school self one piece of advice, what would that be? Don't be scared to talk to girls. <laughs> what's, what's the worst they can do? They, they can say no, you know. But uh, I, 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 was, I was a very underconfident, I was an extremely confident young man in all facets of life, but utterly scared of women. You know, and uh, <laughs> I wish I could be like, don't be like that. You know, yeah. that's, 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 <laughs> well, it was so nice talking to you. I learned so much and it was just I had su- such a good time talking about um, some of my favorite movies. So thank you. Yay. Well, I'm glad we could work this out. This is, is great to meet you and best of luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you so much, Mr. Waters. I'm a huge fan of your movies, and I can't wait to see what's next. And now, before we search it up, here's a quick fun fact. Did you know that Mean Girls was the feature film screenwriting debut for Tina Fey? And now it's time to search it up. Let's see. Oh, Marcy Learoff, who was the casting director on Mean Girls and was also on one of my previous episodes about E.T., was also the casting director on Pretty in Pink. So next time, we're gonna be talking about Pretty in Pink. See you then!